Welcome back, everybody, to Flatirons Tuning. We are here again with another episode of Hey, what's, what's your, your problem? problem? So it's uh, DP and I here, and DP, let's let's just dive right into the questions. All right. Well, first one was from YouTube. It's our good friend Ty, who uh, was having some noise in their transmission. Okay. A kind of an unfortunate sign, you know, of things to come. So the first question is manual or automatic? It's a manual transmission. Okay. And so with this, there's a little bit of like some feeling in the shifter that's not ideal, along with like the hmm ambiguity of where's the, where's the gear? Where's the gear? And unfortunately, in this case, I'm 97% sure the gear is in the fluid. Oh. And they asked, could I do a flush and fill, or is it time for a six speed? So what was they couldn't get it into gear, or they couldn't tell what gear they were in. I think it's that they couldn't tell like getting into fourth gear if it was really there. Ooh. Okay. And so I mean, unfortunately, to me, it sounds like more than just a fluid change. You could obviously dump the fluid, see if right. it's shiny, or like if there's chunks, or if it's not fluid anymore. It's like more of a paste. Well, so let's maybe talk about so with manual transmissions, grinding is is an issue that comes up often. So yeah. where you're trouble, you're having trouble getting into a gear, and you hear a grinding noise as you're trying to do so, and. Oftentimes, like fluid change, that's a question that comes up. Can I? Does this mean that my fluid is bad? Can I just change my fluid, and would that, would that help? Yeah, and the short answer is it's worth a shot. Absolutely. Like but, transmissions are kind of it's it's a Pandora's box, yeah. and and with most of these problems, you're not going to have any idea what the problem is until you drop the transmission, split it open, get in there, look through everything, and then that's. Usually that's the point where you actually can find out what the problem is. So Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's nice to be able to, you know, get the fluid out to see, but most of the time if you suspect, at least with the five speeds, that you may have a problem, you already had a problem. Yeah. And now it's time to call your friends at Flatirons Tuning and say, Hey, I need a six speed. Well, because they're the synchros are a wear item in the transmission. Right. So it's a it's a piece made of usually brass, so it's a softer metal, and it is designed to wear out before the you know the harder metal of the the teeth on the gears or or the shift um, the, the hub and slider would wear out. But once that wear has occurred, you know, the, you know that's it. The, right. the it, it's left the building, and there's really no way to repair it other than to to completely go into the transmission, go through it. Right. Um, but it's always a good place to start to change the fluid. Yeah. Because sometimes, like, if it's not an ideal fluid, if the fluid's old, I mean, there, there's, there are reasons why, you know, bad fluid could cause issues getting into gear, so that's a good place to start. Yeah. Generally, what we've recommended, or what I've always, always recommended, is the Subaru manual transmission fluid. It used yes. to be called Extra S, now it comes in a little white, white one-quart bottle. That stuff is really good at making sure it's got a good balance of lubricity and then a friction modifier to make the synchros work. Um, so you do a fresh fresh fill with that. If that doesn't help, then really your, your only solution there is to go into the transmission. Yeah, and that's, you know, I love the, I still have extra S from my six-speed swap and that stuff. Yeah. That's the hotness, but it smells yeah. funny, but it's yeah. really good All stuff. All gear oils, not... <laughs> not doesn't not good smelling stuff. Right. There's no there's no gear oil candles out there. I don't uh, think. You know, I feel like Yankee Candle could get on that. Like I, fresh don't. gear oil Do and not burned make gear, oil? gear oil candle. No. Like that acrid burn smell. No, maybe not. Maybe no, not I don't that. Think so. Um I believe Ty also asked about options with fluid, you know, if it's not fluid. Yeah. Like, well, should I buy another used transmission or should I bite the bullet and buy a brand new one? I mean yeah. that's tough. I obviously a little biased to buying a new one from us here to get a whole package together for your car. You it's know. your the problem is is that if you have a transmission and you know what the problem is, well, the the advantage is you at least know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So when when you take it out of the car, because a lot of times transmission specialists they want they aren't necessarily going to drive the car first then take it out. A lot of times you have to bring them the transmission and they just kind of have to suss out what might be the problem. So knowing what the problem is is an advantage. Um, used transmissions, I, I wish I wish I could be more optimistic about it, but you have to realize, I think the reality of the situation is now, especially if you're looking at older transmissions, because even, even if you're looking at STI transmissions now, it, as we're recording this, it's 2023. Six-speed transmissions have been in STI since basically 2002, so over 20 years, 20 years, we'll just 
call it 20 years. And that's a long time, that's a lot of age, that's a lot of use. And you just, you never really know for certain that a used transmission is going to be in good usable condition. So what you might actually be doing is trading a problem that you know for a problem that now you don't know or you have to discover. Exactly. You could end up buying a transmission that had neglect, you know, a neglectful owner and has bad yeah. fluid and has chunks in it and you just don't know. Yeah. That's not to say there aren't some unicorns out there, but I mean, it's really for security and peace of mind. Yeah. Like, you know, invest in, you know, a little bit more now. So, you know, it pays dividends later. Well, and the advantage is, I mean, it, it's no fun to think about the cost of going through a transmission. But the advantage of going through a transmission is that, well, you're in the driver's seat. You know that it's gone through. You're, you're going to be able to work with your transmission builder and pick and choose the things that go back into it. Like if you, if you replace all of the synchros, like not just the ones that are worn, but just all of them, all of the bearings. You know that you've now got a transmission, that the gears are in good shape all the synchros and bearings, you should have a lot of life left in that transmission. And, you know, yes, it's going to be probably more money than you want to spend at the moment, but then you know that you have a, a really solid drivetrain versus spending maybe the same amount of money, maybe a little bit less, but just, then just rolling the dice and not knowing. 100%. 100%. Well, I hope Ty you know, gets you some direction. Um, you know, I would definitely say, you know, look into like maybe our you know if you're curious about our six speed swaps get a six speed console on the books we can talk you through it yeah. um maybe by now you've tried a fluid change so hit us up let us know yeah let's let's know if that helped next one we've got chris also from youtube okay um interesting one because we've got a couple of check engine lights po270 and po267 injector low voltage codes on an o3 okay. lgt okay with an engine swap Oh, it's an fine. EJ20X. All right. So this is kind of another Pandora's box, so to speak. Yeah, a little bit. Um, mentioned that they've checked all the voltages. The alternator is, you know, putting out appropriate voltage there. Changed battery just as kind of a diagnostic. We'll see. Nothing changed when they changed pigtails on the injectors, but they still have this problem. Mm -hmm. And so they reached out to us for a little bit of guidance. Well, and I would be curious what, what if any, like, check engine lights are occurring or if they're, you know, more of a description of the issues. If it's an injector low voltage, I mean, maybe the injectors just aren't firing or they're getting, they're getting misfire. Maybe. You know, they're not going to you're getting, the, you know, your PO3 series of codes yeah. as well, like as a misfire set of codes to give you a little bit more direction there. Um, I'd be curious about fuel pressure, like fuel sure. delivery. Sure. Just to kind of make sure we're getting everything on that side also grounds like in general 100%. like intake manifold harness all the grounds right there because yep. there's a myriad of them and if it is you know it's a swapped engine well and the ecu triggers the injectors off of the ground mm -hmm. and so the grounding of of that circuit is really important um and if it's a swapped car and what your o3 it's an o3 legacy so the 20x that i believe is a plastic manifold car which presents some different grounding challenges compared to like a, a cast manifold car. Um, and knowing that basically it was a turbo swap that was done, so you've got wiring uh, that is at play that has changed, plus you know, basically it's a pretty significant ground conditions from what the, the stock car would have had. You know, double checking the grounds, making checking the grounds for continuity and just for their existence. Yes. Because if you're swapping everything in, I mean, maybe you took some, you know, removed a lot of grounds or, or something like that as you're taking everything out, swap the engines, and maybe not all the grounds got reconnected or, or are just missing as they're going back in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thought that I have is, boy, and it's going to be hard with the 2x because what you really want to check this would would be the service manual for that car for that for that engine, the wiring mm -hmm. diagram, but to, to look for any other common circuits or, or items that are on the same grounding circuit as the injectors. Um, just because maybe it's low voltage, it's throwing the code for low voltage on the injectors, but maybe it's actually a fault with another you know sensor or something else that is on that same grounding circuit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it could be one of those, you know, because, you know, the check engine light's not a trained technician or anything it's just yeah. kind of a hey this is a good starting point or unfortunately it will mislead you down like down a rabbit hole that yeah. may not be where you need to go yeah i mean grounds and just checking the grounds for existence checking the, the continuity of the grounds and then just uh, the overall health of the wiring boy that's 
I mean, short of changing out the injectors, which I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would jump to that at this point. Yeah, I, I would say maybe consult a wiring expert if it if it's not something that you can can track down yourself. Definitely, I'd look into like solenoid lights, mm -hmm. and if you've got somebody with like a power probe, specifically like the one with the hook on it that really gets into like you can plug in the harnesses and see what's going on. But yeah, I think you know, it sounds to me also like there could be a grounding issue with the aluminum to a uh, plastic you know, manifold swap. Possible. Oh, wait, and there's there's a wiring swap that has yeah. happened here too. Oh. So <laughs> yeah, so just double double check all of that harness merge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Chris, hopefully that gets you a little bit of something. Um, I'm gonna take a quick pause for Panda Watch. Um, here's your flannel with the collar. It was requested. It was requested. So you know. Yeah. I'll do this for you. It's like 80 degrees outside. Yeah, and, uh, we we got to keep this moving because DP might burst into flames at this point. Woof! Yeah, spontaneous beard combustion. <laughs> we're, we're we're moving into summer, so all of a sudden, like flannel, it just uh, it, it has that flannel ability. It, it does yeah. indeed have that flannel ability. That's yes. going to be the word of the day. So <laughs> I want to see that trending hashtag flannel ability. Flannel ability. Yes. At the end of this podcast. Um, so what's the next one? <laughs> moving on. Yes. Uh, we've got Elijah Bayans. I'm going to say that's 2011 WRX. Had to do the transmission. Doesn't say why, but perhaps see the first series of, you know, questions mm. for you know another person yeah. who had a WRX and put a transmission in. But the car hasn't run right. It's had a low idle ever since the swap. Ever since the transmission swap. Which is kind of an interesting thing. You know, put in a transmission and then he's like, well, why would my car be idling low? Hmm. Um, did some diagnostic things. Cleaned the throttle body. Cleaned the math. Didn't change a whole lot there, but mentioned taking off the intercooler a bunch of times okay so i'm wondering if maybe we've got like a torn boot or anything you know like in, you know any kind of vacuum leak they mentioned no vacuum leaks but as we know there are a million and a half vacuum lines on these cars sure so it might be worth the hashtag smoke the tank here you know like give it a give it yep. a good smoke test you know test yeah i mean if you've got anything any kind of a, a drivability issue or a running issue that could potentially be related to a vacuum leak a smoke test is a great place to start because then you're going to at least know like is is the intake path sealed or is it not sealed yeah and if it's and if it's not sealed if you see any kind of signs of smoke or whatnot run that down because you know if you if you don't know that piece of information first as you're starting and you continue to try and diagnose the issue um then I mean, it could be something, like you said, like a, a torn hose for the intercooler that you're not catching because you're moving the intercooler back and forth as you're doing your diagnostic, but you're just basically adding it or moving the problem as, as you're trying to diagnose, you know, some some other uh, symptom or whatnot. Right, because, I mean, you could be taking that thing on and off, you know, and maybe it's like the little, you know, the little Y on the top, you know, on the bottom of the intercooler, maybe there's a gasket there or something that's... Yeah, well, if, and if it's 11 WRX, you know, the... If depending on the style of the intercooler, if it's a stock style where it bolts to the turbo flames, like maybe there's something wonky with that gasket there, and, and there's a, a big gap yeah. at that point, or you know, back to the PCB system, um, you know, especially you know, it's 11 WRX, it's 2023, we're over 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, if it's got miles on it, um, a lot of those small vacuum hoses, um, they've been cooked for 10 years, and and you, you could basically have. You know, hard plastic pipes instead of soft, compliant, good sealing rubber hoses now. Yeah. Um, and so, like, especially doing a transmission swap or, you know, any kind of substantial amount of work in the engine bay where a lot of stuff is going to have to come out and go back in, so easy to, like, nudge something or, or you know, these, these soft rubber hoses and they just snap. And then you've got this crack that, that is a nasty little vacuum leak that you won't necessarily catch unless you do something like a smoke test. Yeah, definitely. So, um... I would definitely, I would agree. I'd look at PCV system and things because it's interesting. I mean, because if you're under the car, like, you know, everyone, everyone has a hoist, right, for doing transmission work. Like, they all well, get, get... <laughs> just, yeah, no. Oh, wait, no. Or, or a, a guy people. named Hoist. Um, maybe, maybe that's or, it. Or, yeah, his nickname is the Hoist. That, that can yeah. bench press that for you. But yeah, so there's a lot of work in and out and in and out that leads me down that, you know, cracked well, pipe. Well, and the other odd thing with this, 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 these are one of the more frustrating problems when it's, it's a problem that crops up right after you've done a you know, big job on the car that seemingly has no relation to the work that you just did. Absolutely. Like, you didn't touch anything on the engine, you just swapped out the transmission, now you have an idle issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, those two things should be completely different, but, but why, what, could, what is the common thread there? What, how could that, 
the work actually be related to the cause of the new the new problem that you have. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Actually, related to the, pr the previous question, there is a ground strap that goes to the transmission that can often be f overlooked or missed as you're doing a transmission swap. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe check the ground. Yeah. I mean, that'd be worth both of these guys, Chris and Elijah, yeah. you know, you guys like message each other and say, hey, did you check the transmission ground strap? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good um, one. The other thought that I have that's that's weird with this one is because it's an 11WRX, that is a, a drive-by wire throttle body. Mm -hmm. So the weird part there with the idle or what maybe even more more closely points to some kind of a vacuum leak is that the computer has direct control over the throttle body, so it really should be able to control the idle pretty well. So if it's if it's an, an odd idle or the car just doesn't want to idle, you know, that really does kind of point reasonably reasonably strongly towards something like a vacuum leak. I agree. I definitely think that's that's the right path, so hopefully that will get you somewhere to uh, somewhere to turn, for lack of a better term. When you'll get it driving again, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's what he meant. Yeah. All right, let's, All what right. else we got here? We've got my favorite car of the Subaru world, as we okay. all know. I like to keep it boxy. It's an 04 Forester XT. Yeah. Guy's got an automatic transmission with like decent STI type modifications. VF39, okay. turbo excess top mount, up pipe, kind of down pipe. List goes on. Like kind yeah. of a good performance daily driver. Okay. But this one, I've scratched my head on this for a minute. They have an extreme vibration that feels like it's coming from the front of the car to the back of the car that goes away uh, when they put it from park into any gear. So automatic transmission. Automatic. So, I thought so, so the vibration is in park. Yes, which is really real interesting strange. to me, because some um, you know normally I think vibration in the front of the engine I'd think like balancer, like you know the rubber's worn out, but that would just be exacerbated when you put it in gear and drove it. Yeah, because then you would just be like, what is going on? My next thought goes to like noise vibration harshness from a stiff pitch mount, like one of those solid billet guys, or or a failed engine mount for that or, matter. Because it's, yeah. I mean, we're talking about an 04. It's got some, got some time on it. You know, maybe there's something that's loading up the engine or the transmission when it's in park um, that it, you're getting a, a harmonic for a failed transmission or a failed engine mount that's, that's giving you all this noise and vibration. Yeah. That then, you know, once you load it up by putting it into drive, maybe then that's why, that's, that's what's weird about this yeah. one particularly is that it's only in park. There is more of a wrinkle here. Yeah. Oh. There is there's even more? In okay. fact, but wait, there's more. Oh, if you geez. act now, okay. we'll add group N engine mounts that were professionally installed by a trusted technician. Okay. Group N engine mounts. Interesting. Yes. And there's been bushings. There's been, like, you know, you know, super pro bushings and things added to try and, like, find where this is coming from. Hmm. So, I mean, they've put some time and effort in, but I really... So the group N engine mount, so mm -hmm. what that is, that is a... It looks exactly like a stock engine mount, but it's just got harder durometer rubber. It's like in the case of the engine mounts, it, it basically, the stock engine mount to the Group N side by side, they don't look any different. The Group N is harder rubber. You can actually tell because the rubber has a Bridgestone logo on it, at least for a long time it did. I think it still does. Um, so, I mean, they, they do tend to transmit a little bit more noise and vibration, but it is a rubber mount. Right. It is not a rigid mount. It's not like some of these newer mounts, like uh, some of the IEG streets and whatnot, where you just have a very small polyurethane puck to absorb the noise and vibration. Where you, that would be less surprising if there was more noise and vibration from an engine mount, where you just have less material to absorb that. Okay. The vibration. So I mean, it's it's plausible that the group end mounts could be playing a part. Certainly. Um, I guess I would I would if they were really were I would expect that they would have the noise would have come about pretty recently or like right after the engine mounts were installed versus yeah. somewhere down the road after the engine mounts were installed yeah and it sounds like this person's driven this way for a hundred thousand miles they say oh my so really like okay. quite a trooper to drive you know your wonderful toaster with this kind of like earth-shaking vibration for that long that's crazy and almost i wonder man could something in like the torque converter be out of balance I wondered, maybe, you know, this would be another one, like, fluid would be a good thing to change or check yeah. here, like, fluid check, level, you know, yeah. check the ATF, make sure that it's 
clean, doesn't smell horrendous Yankee Candle. Let's also see a burned ATF uh, candle yeah. go in there. Yep. If we're going to make some, yeah. some funky ones. But yeah, I look at like a you know, torque converter, you know, maybe it's not got enough fluid in it or the fluid is torched in the transmission. And yeah. once you're in gear, you know, it's going through the, you know, through the uh, radiator, through tranny cooler and keeping it cool-ish. But when the, it's sitting there, it's not flowing. The thing that's just the weirdest to me, if, if we're understanding, or if I'm understanding this correctly, is that he's sitting in park and there's the vibration, then you put it in a drive and then the vibration goes away. Yeah. That's, that's super weird. That part, I, I don't 100% get it. But I, I, And I will admit, I am not an automatic transmission expert. So I, you know. That, that, but that just that stands out to me as like there's just something super wonky there. There is, you know, because I mean, as far as the you know, the automatic goes, you have it in park, and there's a gnome that's sleeping. Yep. And you wake the gnome up by pulling yep. the lever back. Yeah. And then it runs, you know, in the direction kind of like a big hamster wheel, and I mean, wakes honestly, up other. Honestly, that that makes total sense to me. I could totally yeah. believe that. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's my extent on like the four EAT as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you should have known. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. I think I think at that point. If, if nothing else works, if changing the fluid, nothing else is, is standing out to you, if there's no sign of, of like a, a worn mount or anything like that, I think taking the car to somebody that specializes in automatic transmissions, mm-hmm. because they'll, they'll probably go, well, there's your problem. Yeah. It, this, I, it can't be that unique, but it, it sounds like it's a really strange problem. Indeed. You know, it's an interesting rabbit, you know, unique yeah. up on it. You know? Yeah. Well, if you do figure out what it is, definitely let us know, mm-hmm. because that is that is a curious one to be sure. Absolutely, and I hope your transmission shop says, well, there's your problem, because then you can say, hey, here's my problem. Here's my problem. Yes, we would like to know. Yeah. All right. Then so we got a couple more here. A couple more here. This is, uh, I don't really know where this one came from. I'm, a, I'm thinking this one came from Instagram. If not, I'm sorry for giving you credit where you weren't. Um, but person has an 05 Legacy GT. Okay. It's got an aftermarket downpipe and an STI turbo, so probably VF39. Yeah. So VF39 e- family. Yeah, so something adjacent to that. Mm-hmm. Notices that power falls off at the top end when they're pulling hard. Okay. And doing some checking, it looks like their boost pressures are dropping off. Okay. So this one also tell you know tells me, hmm, what's going on? So we look further into it. They have a big fuel pump. Okay. I don't know what injectors, I don't know if they were listed, but turns out that they are maxing out their fuel pump at like 15% duty cycle on their injectors at times. Okay, I wonder what, how they're measuring that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, that's just what we're given, yeah. you know, but if, you know, if that were the case, I was originally leading towards another one of our like PCV type problems where we've got a boost leak. Maybe, but, but I, I think what he says... If I if I'm remembering the question right, is that the the boost drops off, but only a few pounds. Yeah. So they're they're still making he's still making boost pressure at the upper RPM range, but the boost is just falling off, and he just kind of feels like the power is just is dropping off. Right. And wasn't there a detail about check engine lights? Um, this one was no check engine lights, if I remember correct. I think that's what I was recalling too, which is a, which is another interesting detail. Yeah. So we've got that. Yeah, you know, no check engine light, dropping off at I don't know what boost pressure it is because they don't mention it. Right. So, so we get a question a lot, or it comes up often enough about boost taper. Like yep. my my target boost is set at seventeen pounds of boost, and I hit seventeen pounds of boost at whatever RPM, and then like, but by red line, I'm making four pounds, five pounds less than my target, what however much, and you know, I want to fix that. Yeah. Well, as the engine spins faster, the engine is basically an air pump. It's pumping more air. The, the faster it's spinning, the more air it's pumping over over a given uh, period of time. To maintain a boost pressure, the turbo has to be able to feed the engine more air than it's consuming. Right. And you know, if you want to have 12 psi, you have to feed it you know a pretty significant amount more air than it is actually consuming as the engine is going around. And so when you have a stock turbo, boost tapering off towards red line and power falling off towards red line is not unusual. In fact, that's normal because the flow of the turbo just can't keep up with the rate that the engine is consuming air in an upper RPM range, say over you know, 6,000 RPM, 6,500 RPM, something like that. Yeah. That's not, that isn't, in and of itself is not unusual. So that could actually be 
basically just normal par for the course because it is a, a stock STI turbo. Um, the weird thing here is, is that maxing out the fuel or, or the fuel pump. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that and there's not a lot of details as, as how you would measure that. I mean, DP, what are your thoughts as far as like how you have a measure or output from the ECU for injector duty cycle certainly, but information coming out of the fuel pump is is maybe less readily available. What would you what would you look for? What would you want to see there? If it were my car and I had the tools, which I don't have access to, I would want to hook up a lab scope. Okay. To the wiring to the fuel pump. Yeah. Because it is just a ro- you know rotating pump, sure. I could then see the pattern and see, you know, I'd take a sweep, get all the you know, get all the details for like you know zero to I think you know zero to twelve volts, mm-hmm. and see what I'm getting. Sure. Because maybe you know maybe there's not enough fuel being delivered because there's not enough you know coming you know there's not enough signal you know not enough current mm-hmm. from. Well, and there should be a ramp up. There should yeah. be uh, most of these cars, and I'm not. 100% sure with the legacy, but I'm pretty sure it's, this is the same, is that there's three different stages of the fuel pump for, for the duty cycle. And, you know, I think full full voltage is, or 100% duty cycle is basically when there's there's no pulsing of the pump. It's, you know, all the current is just going to it. Um, but, I mean, with your scope, you, sh- you should be able to basically read, you know, what the voltage is to the pump, if it is if it is ramping up or not. Yeah. And, and what the maximum voltage is and, and what that pattern is once you reach that, you know, 100% duty cycle with the fuel pump. Right. That would be interesting. The other thing that I'd be curious about is fuel pressure. Yeah. Because if, if the pump is not getting a lot of voltage, then the pump, I mean, it's going to be able to send some amount of fuel to the engine, but it's not going to be able to send a full optimal amount of fuel to the engine. So with low voltage, it's possible that you'd see a fuel pressure drop. And, right. and, and, and regardless, like if you see fuel pressure dropping below where what you want your target minimum to be, that I mean that could also be, you know, the, this problem of, of you know, why is there why is no there no power up top? Could be. Maybe uh, you know that wiring back there towards that fuel pump controller is pretty tiny. Yeah. So um, I was considering, like, you know, check all the wiring there. Maybe it's time to hardwire in a fuel pump if you're looking at bigger power goals. Well, and check the function of the factory factory fuel pump controller. Yep. There, there is a fuel pump controller back there that basically controls how much voltage is getting to the pump. That's that's what the ECU is controlling when you have this duty cycle. Right. They can go bad. Um, so there again, you know, putting putting a um, an oscilloscope or something on the wiring to see, all right, what is going on with the voltage that's going to the pump. But then measure the output of the pump via fuel pressure. You know? Yeah. Like what, what's happening with that? Um, I mean, an SCA turbo is, a, I mean, that's not a very big turbo. Mm-hmm. So there again, like the boost tapering is pretty normal. That, that is not surprising. I would not expect, you know, uh, any car with an SCA turbo to really pull hard at redline if, you, if you're making more than, you know, 13, 14 pounds of boost. Yeah. You start- which, which most people probably are. Yeah, you know, you you hear people talking about running like twenty six psi on like stock turbos, and you're like, Oof. man, you are way past the island of efficiency on that. Yeah. It's just making hot air, yeah. and I mean that might be the case here. Is maybe it would drive better at a lower boost pressure? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, and, and the more you're, you're more the more you're pushing boost pressure at the lower RPMs, then then the more there's going to be a deficit in the upper RPM range. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so, I think electric. Check out the voltage. Do electrical testing on the fuel pump, and then fuel pressure. Hopefully, one of those two tests will give you the bad reading that will point you in the direction of what the problem is. Yes, indeed. Yes. All right, and we have one more, and it's kind of also a head scratcher. Right. This, this came, is this is from our Discord, I believe. Yes, this was from the Discord. This was a user burrito. Yes. So if you got questions for us and, and you want to. You want to see if we'll talk about them, or want us to talk about them? You can you know, certainly leave them in the comments below wherever you're watching this video. But you can also reach out to us through our Discord, which there's a link to in our in the description of this video. And uh, yeah, we, we pay attention to that too. But this is this is an interesting one. This is an interesting one indeed. We will get wrapped up in this formal oh. burrito. Okay. Okay. Tortilla. We get to the end. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, helping out a friend with an 04 WRX. It's an automatic, mostly stock rebuild. You know, it's got an in, you know a turbo inlet intake and a downpipe, which might lead us down the the way we need to go here. Okay. Inferno Two is giving some interesting readings. You know, saying it's constantly running fat. 
Okay, rich. Yep. Yeah. So it's you know it's pushing out an air, you know air fuel correction at minus twenty five percent. So it's definitely got it's trying to correct. Which that is that is its maximum that the maximum correction too. So it's well, however bad it thinks it is, it is doing as much to correct for it as it possibly can. So it's it's saying this is real bad. This is real bad. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. But then, the person has put on an aftermarket Denso sensor for the front O2 from the front O2. Yeah. Not just once, right? But twice from your local car parts store. Yeah. And I mean, there's something to be said here for maybe an OEM unit that should go in. Well, but we, you but haven't you haven't said what the symptom is yet. I haven't gotten there yet. All right. So we so we know but, there's two two front O2 sensors. What's going on? But when they unplug the O2 sensor, the car idles perfectly. Well, so so. Odd idle. Hunting yeah, so idle is the problem. We're doing this, you know, ah, ah, and then we unplug, yeah. and the issue goes away. Yeah. Hmm. So, and, and, uh, let's see. What was the other, oh, there was some other key piece of that. Um, let's see, unplug the math. You know, so it goes close loop, open loose, loop. Um, second of those. Yeah. So... Oh, the fact the fact that it's it is you're getting a, a rich condition and the ECU is trying to correct it at idle. Right. Yeah. So, it's, so it, it both all of these things seem to be pointing to the O2 sensor. Right. Now historically, what is your, what are your thoughts on a non OEM front O2 sensor? Well, as we all know, I, I worked at Napa for a long, long time before yeah. this. Yeah. And I sold every brand under the sun. Yeah. But there are certain things that I would prefer over others, you know, and like O2 sensors are one of the things I would prefer to go OEM on. Yeah. And most of the time that's going to be Denso or NTK. Yeah. But there's something different when it comes from the, you know, the Subaru box. The calibration, the specs, something. Something just, yeah. A, a problem, a running issue, something like this, after placing a factory sensor with basically an auto parts sensor, even if it's the same brand, Denso for Denso, yep. what have you, is not that uncommon. And, and in the past, historically, um, my recommendation is always put in, a, put in a factory O2 sensor and then see if the problem persists. Yeah. Because a lot of the time when they do that, then all of a sudden everything then works and the problem goes away. Exactly. And read, you know, read further on to, down here, this person even replaced the ECU to see if it would help. Right. So you know, you which know, I mean, it's it's one of those like, denso sensor for denso sensor. I mean, yeah. You have two of them. The likeliness of the sensor being a problem does seem unlikely. Seems low. Potentially. So then, yeah, that's a that's a pretty pretty high level of diagnostic. That is, you it, know, just still you, have the problem persist. Yeah, like that's unfortunate when you replace an ECU and you still have a problem, and you've done the sensors. Like, well, it can't be the sensor. I just replaced that. But I would definitely like you know get an OEM sensor, find, like, if you could find the car, like, you know, the car that you borrowed the ECU from, borrow the O2 sensor just to see, because that car probably didn't have that yeah. issue. that's not a bad suggestion at you all. You know, like, try, you know, try a known good unit in there. To... Yeah, before you, before you, I mean, the reason that a lot of us go to a parts store to get an O2 sensor is the factory one is pretty darn expensive, and it's, you know, half the cost or less from your local auto parts store. And it's Denso for Denso. I mean, yeah. You know that the factory one is a Denso, you can get a Denso. Um, so, that yeah, see if you can borrow a known good sensor before you plunk down the money on a factory unit. Um, that would absolutely be a good place to start, too. I agree. I mean, checking the ECU, I think, is, is a that is a very high level of diagnostic. Um, if you've tried everything else, and that, that seems to be the only other thing, especially because this car doesn't have a, an immobilizer, it's possible to like do that, like borrow some of these ECUs. I mean... Now you know that piece of information as well. Yeah. Now, I, I think, didn't he say that he was wondering if it had something to do with the tune? He did, yeah. and I know my thought there is probably not. Well, but I think I think he came back later. And, and in this case, we actually have... A, we're cheating a little bit because we do know what the solution that he found was, but which is interesting. So I think everything to this point, that, was the, that would be the normal diagnostic yeah. process for this kind of a problem. But knowing that he thought it might be something in the tune, so the first indicator there is there's a tune on the car. Yes. So when you if you're if you have a mechanical problem, you have to diagnose it and, and fix it mechanically. 
But if there's an issue with the tune, you can change everything mechanically out, but if there's still an issue, you know, it might not be down to something in the tune and the calibration, something along those lines that is causing the problem. So it sounds like he ultimately went in that direction and it ended up being something to do, at least to, to the point where he left it with us, was something to do with the calibration for the uh, scaling of the injectors. Yeah. So, so that was, it's, I've, basically what he said is that he, he thought that it might have been a bad injector or bad injector scaling because changing out the injectors and then changing the scaling for the new injectors that he put in, that's what ended up correcting the issue. Right. Which is interesting. Now that kind of, if you go back to the very beginning where the car is just running so rich even at idle, that does kind of fit. It does. Um, the wonder that I have there is, was, uh, was the stock injector installed as the starting point or was it something different? So that's, I guess, we'll never know, but yes, I... changing out the injectors and then changing the scaling to the injectors, knowing that the scaling is correct and then the, the issue f fixes itself, I mean, that makes sense also because it was basically the, the injectors were just dumping in too much fuel. Yeah, and the ECU was trying to do what it could. But yep, they must you know. they must have been bigger injectors because if it's pulling out twenty five percent of the duty cycle and you're still running you know off the charts rich at idle, That's... I mean that would kind of that would kind of fit with a bigger injector that was not properly scaled that was put in and so that the duty cycle was just off. Right. So it could be even something like that, and especially if if it's uh, like if the car that you're working on is new to you, like you just got the car or if you're working on it from with a friend or from a friend that you don't have all the history, I mean, you can't look past all of these details because this is a, a, an O4 clearance. Yeah. yeah. So like one of the first things that would probably be good after you've done all the simple electronic diagnostics is look at the injectors because the injectors should be that kind of light, I don't know, baby blue almost. Blue, yeah, it's like blue-ish. If it's, if it's any other color than that really light, weird blue color, then it's something different. And so then that might be something to to check out, like, you know, because at this point it would not be unusual to get a, a, a new to you used WRX from a previous owner that had, you know, some level of modification done and then undone, and then some things maybe get left, like injectors after yep. other things have been taken off. So I mean that could certainly could certainly happen. It definitely could. So I guess the, you know, the lesson there is, you know, do your homework when you're getting a modified car or what you think might be a partially modified car. And never assume that, that any of the parts on a, on a car that is modified or that you see signs that has been modified are the correct parts, especially if you think it's mostly stock. Yeah. You really kind of have to look over everything and, and you know, as they say, trust, trust no part. Right. Yeah. It, you never know what, what somebody could have done. 100%. Yeah, at some point we're gonna to have to tell people about Sweet House's, um, I don't know, rigged up parallel fuel system. Yes, the like DIY homebrewed parallel, parallel fuel, fuel system. system. Yeah, we'll call it that. That ended up that ended up biting him to the point where the car almost burned down. Yes, um, you know that was that was a scary day. Yeah, yeah. You never want to you know start your day off with somebody running in. Does anyone have a fire extinguisher? That's true. That's that's not the norm. It for will us. wake you up faster than coffee, though. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but so that'll be, uh, maybe we'll talk about that in the next episode. Yeah, so. I hope so. Well, thanks very much for, for listening. Thanks for your support as always. Uh, as I said before, you know, if you've got any questions that you want us to talk about or you want to throw out to us, leave them in the comments below. Uh, you can reach out to us through Discord. You can also, you know, s uh, send in a ticket to contact us link on our website. Um, all those, any of those channels that, that come to us, that's a great way to send, send your questions in. Uh, the more information you can give us about the problem, the better. We'd be love to know about check engine lights or no check engine lights. That That is a big help as well. Yes. Um, yes. And, uh, yeah, and always remember that we are just two parts guys that have spent way too much time behind the counter. There's no substitute for a professional hands-on mechanic um, if, if, uh, if you can't figure out what's going on with your car. Yes. And in that case, if we give you bad advice, you know, or advice that goes pear-shaped and you get something different from a tech that actually, like, fixes it, let, let us know. Us know. That yeah. way we can learn something too, because I mean, you know, we've been doing this each, you know, twenty some years, and and, know, and we can pass it on to the community. So, yeah, and we, yeah. you know, we still learn things new every day, and yeah, we can all share to learn a little bit of something. Absolutely. So thanks again for your support, and until next time, as always, stay tuned to Flatiron Tuning. Thanks everyone for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. Once again, we'd like to let you know that your support is what makes this show possible. Be sure to check out our online store at FlatironsTuning.com for any of your aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts needs. And as always, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning.